What is happening in the financial markets? First off, read this disclaimer carefully. And do your good deed of the day by liking and subscribing. So, uh, when we go here to the sectors, and you know, the components here are they are major, you know, diversified ETFs. Notwithstanding that, all of this diversification, the average here in financial services is down minus 16%. Falling minus 20% away from the 52 week highs is considered to be the definition of a bear market. So financial services are approaching bear market. Energy uh, is in a bear market. Technology, bear market. Consumer cyclicals, minus 28%. This is actually becoming more of a serious, severe bear market. Healthcare, minus 21%. Notwithstanding that, the S&P 500 is down minus 2.42%. Obviously, there's something afoot. Um, there is this stealth bear market. And when we look here at the megatrends, the average is minus 44% away from the 52-week highs of these 813 stocks. And that's a bunch of stocks, okay? That's a lot of stocks. Of these, 607 are in a bear market. So 75% of the megatrend stocks are in a bear market. And these are strong trends. These are the themes of the future. Um, the, the fact is, the numbers are here. Investors are not bullish on the far future. Because that is what these, these themes represent. They do not represent um, something like, um, you know, what these large cap S&P 500 stocks represent. You know, they just represent current business climate. That's it. Uh, companies that have growth, but nothing in particular. The, it's just uh, business as usual, status quo. These companies here, they represent the future. Investors are not bullish on the future. If they were bullish on the future, we simply would not have 75% of megatrend, you know, futuristic stocks in a bear market. So the, so the sentiment here in the market has definitively, it's not bullish, it just isn't. And when you look at the other themes, and these are more like business indicator themes, uh, you have like fertilizers, pesticides, football clubs, trading platforms, um, you have a bunch of bear, bear markets. So the average theme is minus 22% away, mi minus 23% away from the 52 week highs. It's in a bear market. The economically sensitive are approaching minus 30%. Home improvement down to minus 34%. Legacy media minus 31%. These are bear markets. So let's now jump into some charts. So yeah, I think I think that's the the thing here. Uh, something is going on that is not reflected, obviously, in the S&P 500. And then you might think to yourself, well, given all of these bear markets, doesn't it follow logically that we should avoid these kinds of exotic themes and rather just put our money on the S&P 500? Because it, it's holding up, right? But this is one of those logical fallacies people make because what they don't take into account is how people, how you behave to different types of investments. So when you when you have an account, you know, and you buy a position on the S and P five hundred through the, the SPY ETF, the the dollar position size will be much bigger than when you put on a position in something like let's say Teladoc. So when you buy a position in Teladoc, the dollar position is way smaller than the SPY. Because of that, if you have a minus 10% loss on your Teladoc position, the overall dollar effect on your account is going to be much smaller than a minus 3% pullback on the S&P 500 due to position sizing. 
And not only that, you know, position sizing, of course, it's a huge, uh, very important topic. Um, frankly, more important than technical analysis. And these are topics that I, I explore in the um, uh, courses I am making because uh, something I have, you know, come across, um, um, it, it's just the thing. Um, um, I think the big issue with a lot of analysts is that uh, there's this very strong focus on um, just uh, finding what to invest in instead of actually how to manage those positions because position management uh, is way 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 more important than all of the other stuff like fundamental analysis technical analysis seasonality uh, no correlations even uh, those are far less important than actually what you do when you have a position on but yeah uh, beyond position sizing being a very clear uh, and also um, a, a very sneaky uh, risk factor because because it's on the one hand you can clearly see it in your account but it's very easy to like lose perspective um, to, to the point where you even though you have bigger losses on the wild cards uh, you have picked um, obviously I am I am very much uh, a proponent of um, active position, position position management so I don't think anyone should accept uh, any big loss on any position but let's say you have a person who doesn't use stops okay so that that person has you know a bunch of loss um, numbers um, double digits on some wild cards but because they are smaller positions um, the big risk is actually in something like the S&P 500 it could even be that something like the WTI, the Total World Stock Market Index ETF. For many accounts, this is the riskiest position they have because it's so big. Um, you know, a, a bear market pullback in something like the WTI, you know, minus twenty percent, it could be just disastrous for many accounts. Far less disastrous than getting like butchered on some. Uh, Take like Corsair, Corsair. And there's many people who have bought, you know, shares in Corsair, uh, being bullish on that. Um, the average particip participant definitively has red numbers, but the thing is, um, in all likelihood, um, the position they do have dollar-wise is small compared to whatever they have with the major indexes. But yeah, yeah. So it's just something to think about. So let's now look at, okay, so what is going on here with SP500? So we recently made a new all-time high that is obviously bullish. Uh, going here to the daily data points. We, so so there's there's been a change though. So here throughout this period, you can see that, so let's actually draw that in. Uh, you see that we use uh, very systematically the green 50 day moving average as a support level. So during this time, um, the index was holding up pretty pretty strong but what happened recently is that we started started to downgrade uh, to the blue 100 day moving average as support and now we are using it similarly to what how we used the 50 day moving average back here so there is a downgrade here so the, so even though yes technically speaking clearly we recently made a new all-time high but the bears are allowed to explore new moving averages. The reason why the bears are able to do that is simply because we don't get enough buyers here at you know, the green 50 day. And that is why this is why moving averages are so important and why they are also so... Uh, you, you need to understand them, understand them from a more dynamic perspective. The re so the reason why the 50 day moving average works here to a large extent, is frankly, it's self-fulfilling prophecies. Investors see that it works and they are willing to buy, and because they are willing to buy, it goes up. Here, um, because of this, actually, the 50-day moving average lost legitimacy. Now, uh, the bulls put on smaller positions. So when you have something like this, support fails, and now instead we get support here. Which so it begs the question, 
Uh, will the blue 100 day moving average then lose legitimacy due to some violation? Because we did have some violation of that moving average back here. So, which means that it's so basically there could be some more meaningful correction on the S&P 500 uh, on the horizon, given this change here in the investor sentiment. Still, obviously, the S&P 500 is holding up way better than um, the vast majority of um, alternatives out there, but there is still there is something happening that is likely to embolden uh, the bears uh, and spook the bulls a bit. Yeah, okay, so let's now look at some, um, yeah, just to go through a bit different markets. So here we have the TLT. Uh, and here we do have this, you know, head and shoulders pattern that I have talked about before. So you got that uh, left shoulder, left shoulder, you got the big head. And here you do see that the bulls tried to neutralize the right shoulder, but um, the bears are back at it. So you do have this clear um, textbook uh, head and shoulders pattern with the TLT. Uh, and uh, the head and shoulders, they do have a track record of um, working out for the bears here. So, so, so this is an interesting setup for the bears. Um, when we look here at, yeah, let's look at gold. Let's look at gold futures. Yeah, so gold is continuing to be a bit of an annoying um, investment. Uh, it's not going really down. It's not really going up either. It's stuck a bit in a range. Uh, we are now in the lower end of that range. So it, it's just messy. But long term, I am bullish on, on gold. Um, there's just too many reasons to be bullish. Uh, the problem is that even though there's so many factors out there, um, for why you should be bullish on gold. There's obviously also bearish bearish factors, but I think that the average of all the factors are bullish for gold. The big question is, when will the market fully react to those variables? That is something that differs. Let's illustrate that actually with the Nasdaq. Uh, so even though uh, it is fully known that the Federal Reserve has changed um you know they they, they just uh, the for there's been a change in the force you know they are not going to be that supportive of the market going forward uh you know they they are uh, concerned you know about uh, uh things like uh, inflation and uh, also just uh, the market basically just overheating so even though we have known about these things for some time, you see that we're looking here at you know, the weeks. So let's actually measure it. So here, here's where we, here where we made you know the all-time high. So it's been you know 49 days where we have attempted to make some progress, but now we have just pulled back here to this purple 20-week moving average. Uh, but what these candlesticks, you know, reflect here is just uh, the market trying to sort of figure out what all of these variables mean. Is it bullish? No, it's bearish. Bullish? No, it's actually bearish. Well, it's very bearish, but then it's bullish. Bullish? No, it, actually it's bearish. So th there is this indecisiveness here in uh, in the market. That is, you know, uh, that and that is the real story behind these candlesticks, because these candlesticks are formed by, you know, real money being pushed in and out of the QQQ, you know, out of the Nasdaq. So think of this more like, so don't look at this from like an accountant perspective or a financial analyst perspective. Think of this more like a psychologist. So as a psychologist, what does the, so that is basically what this means. Uh, as a psychologist, look at what this uh, purple 20-week moving average means. Here we see that it functions as support and the bulls uh, feel confident and they push higher. Here we test it a bit and then the bulls get back into action and we go higher. Now we are testing it a bunch of times without making progress. To be more specific, without you know, the bulls here making progress. So I would say that when it comes to the Nasdaq, I think that the bears have a bigger opportunity than they have had in quite some time. Yeah, it's because ever since this uh, 2020 
lockdown low, uh, the bulls have been rather quick uh, to buy here uh, support. And now they are missing in action. Not completely, but, but this is interesting from a bear, bearish perspective. And obviously, if you know the bulls were to come back uh, and really get aggressive to support this support level, then that would neutralize a bearish thesis. So next, we go to Bitcoin. Um, so back here, if you look at the videos I made, I was very, I was very worried uh, during this. Uh, let's draw it in. During this rally here, I was concerned about us forming a double top. And that is what we did. Um, uh, so we do have a double top, uh, and we also have a new pattern now, and that is in the form of a uh, head and shoulders. So you have a left shoulder, you do have a head. Um, so th there is the potentiality of us now forming that right shoulder. That also means, though, that we could have a bit of a rally on the horizon. So let's draw the horizontal support in. So we do have horizontal support here. Boom, boom, and boom, and boom, and boom. So so, so you do have horizontal support. Um, and uh, the bears are not going to be that panicky, really, about uh, a right shoulder being formed. Because I think, I think, I don't think that the cur uh, the, this, I don't think that, let's draw it in. I don't think this was the right shoulder. Some would argue that this here is the right shoulder. It is possible that we have a tiny right shoulder. Um, but I think um, I think that what happened here, what happened here is a parallel to what happened here. Hence, um, we could expect a more major uh, right shoulder to form um, in the not too distant future. That would lead to a rally. But if we do get, you know, that right shoulder and the head and shoulder plays itself out, meaning it triggers, you know, the bears to put on short positions uh, as we get up towards uh, the region of the left shoulder, um, th that does mean that it could be some bad times uh, for Bitcoin on the horizon. A longer term, but shorter term, uh, there could be a bull rally. So yeah, so that's Bitcoin. Um, yeah, this is why I'm I'm a big proponent of doing things very carefully. Uh, you know, we should have waited until we had enough strength to make a new all-time high. Instead, uh, it was uh, very ambitious, uh, too early. We did not have enough energy to hold on to those high levels uh, to to attract new bulls. The bears noticed, and now we have a very precarious situa situation. So let's, yeah, I, th I think that we are kind of running a bit out of time here. But yeah, to sum up my take here for the market, um, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, it really is. Uh, we do see clearly um, that many uh, sectors and subsectors Industries and sub-industries are in bear markets. Even though uh, there's been many support levels along the way, potential support levels, those support levels, they failed. That's obviously annoying, um, frustrating, but uh, the thing about support levels is that they only work if enough people recognize them as support levels. So when you ha when you have you know a mega trend stock as an example that pulls down to support, the seasonality is decent, fundamentals look decent. Um, there's even insiders buying. In that situation, for it to go up, you need to have people turn bullish. If nobody turn turns bullish, well, if if uh, the majority of participants do not turn bullish, then that stock will not be able to use that support level as support. So that's the paradox here. So if you want to learn more about uh, the market from a more deeper perspective, 
then I would certainly recommend uh, this uh, subscription. It is currently closed for new, for new members, but I will reopen it pretty soon. And these are the courses that I cover. Friendly introduction, well, the courses I am creating. So friendly introduction to investing, themes shaping our future, sun investing psychology, alpha investing, the power of money from sticks to cryptos, and options and other derivatives. So I've currently created uh, a uh, almost seven hours of content. Um, I'm going to create uh, more uh, soon. Uh, I, I, so I will I will open it uh, for new members when I have around yeah nine hours of content because then I can you know fully justify uh, the price. Now, the great thing about you know this uh, subscription is that it's just one subscription, so you get everything that I currently have and I will just add you know more and more content going forward so the value of the subscription is going to go up so it's sort of like it's like a stock you know you uh, it's a stock that uh, uh, keeps going up I guess you know in, in, in value and everyone has uh, the opportunity to get in at you know uh, the low price yeah uh, so there's a bunch of great the great uh, stuff in that uh, subscrip subscription. Uh, another thing that I do there is audits of the um, investing thesis that I publish on uh, YouTube. So, you know, an audit is, you know, when you, I just look at, you know, videos I have published, thesis that I presented, because in the, in the vast majority of videos I publish, you see that I'm either bullish or bearish leaning in one direction. So I make uh, videos where the thesis can be wrong. And that is very important. If you look at, you know, other, you know, finance uh, channels you subscribe to and you listen, to, you know, to the videos, I guarantee you uh, the majority of them do not um, present clear theses where they can be wrong. It's like, oh, it can go up or it can go down. Very wishy-washy. Um, that is, of course, good for them because um, they can create this perpetual illusion of, um, you know, sort of being right. Um, but that is just an illusion. Um, the stuff they present has no uh, utility. Uh, it, it is not research, it's just commentary. Everyone can comment. I mean, every, I, I could just make videos myself where I'm like, oh, Bitcoin, oh, it's down, uh, that's, oh, bearish. Uh, I can on, and look at the spy and be like, ah, oh, bullish. Uh, I could be like, um, let's look at um, GE, G -E, like, oh, it went up now. Oh, yeah, bullish. It went up uh, three weeks, you know, bullish. But but that is not, th that that is useless. Uh, the important thing is, okay, what is going to happen here? Okay, what is most likely to, going to happen in in like 2023 with the GE or you know later this year and in order to answer those kinds of um, questions uh, you need to you know do actual research you just can't sit there and comment uh, so the thing is that you know with, with the audits I do of the videos uh, I then sort of I'll do an autopsy especially um, uh, on those uh, theses that did not work out because um, the theses that work out, you know, they are obviously fun, um, yeah, but you know they don't tell us that much. What is also what is very interesting that's those um, theses that you know fail. Uh, so let's say that I make a video, uh, I find a support level, but then support fails. Then it is very interesting to actually figure out why it failed and how that can inform us going forward. And um, this is something that is very, very rare in this space. I have subscribed to a bunch of uh, like newsletters and research, quote unquote, research over the years, and um, it is extremely rare for any of them to actually do an autopsy on the trades that do not work out. That is so rare, it's just amazing. Um, even though those are actually the ones that will inform you the most, you know, where you learn the most. 
uh, because my long-term plans with the Diamond Arm is not simply, you know, to just do research, uh, uh, good research, it's uh, to uh, create, you know, a hedge fund uh, and ETFs, but that is more longer term. In order to do that, it is very important to um, uh, get, uh, you know, to attract people uh, that uh, have a similar mindset. So if you are still watching this video now, after it's been, you know, uh, 25 minutes, then you are the type of person that I am uh, most likely to hire in uh, the future. So look, so yeah, be on the lookout for all kinds of opportunities relating to Diamond Arm.